I'm Pippa Norris, and I'm going to talk about new challenges to electoral integrity as part of the EIP workshop. And in particular, what I'd like to do is present something on the US case in comparative perspective, because I think new challenges are really illustrated by what's happening in America today. Let's talk about the long-term weaknesses in how American elections are covered. And in particular, this is an issue which has been studied by the EIP since 2012. Problems didn't start with the election of President Trump, nor will they end with President Biden. Secondly, we'll think about the reasons for the growing threats to electoral integrity. And I'm going to argue four factors in particular are important. Party polarization, not just about values, but about the rules. Party control of state laws, authoritarian values in the electorate, and institutional inertia, making it very difficult to bring in any reforms to the current system. And the lessons and the implications which are there for studying electoral integrity and for thinking about these issues in cases around the world. So first, what can we think about the long-term weaknesses? Well, these are issues which are very controversial in America. And in particular, the GOP has often emphasized as electoral integrity is about problems of fraud or those who are not qualified voting. But to clarify from the outset, electoral integrity project has always defined electoral integrity much more in terms of international conventions, the standards which exist and which the world's government have signed on to in a series of treaties, protocols and guidelines. And they're not simply about the end stage, they're about all aspects of the election from the pre-election period through the campaign, through polling day and its aftermath. And there's 11 steps and each one can be problematic. The laws are clearly critical for establishing a foundation for free and fair elections, but also the detailed administrative procedures. Even small things can go wrong technically in an election in a particular district and disrupt the whole confidence in the election itself. Boundaries are important. The way in which the process is either impartial or partisan in how boundaries are drawn. Voter registration, whether they're inclusive or whether large sectors of the population are, are finding it difficult to register, who, who are eligible to vote. Party registration is another major issue, particularly for minor parties, campaign media and the role of misinformation, campaign funding and the role of dark money, voting processes. And this is where most of the attention has been who gets qualified to vote, how convenient is it? But let's remember that that comes long after all these other aspects have been established. The vote count, and again, increasingly contentious about the accuracy of that, the results, and then the role of electoral officials, normally the electoral management body in most countries with the national body, but also the role of state officials in the United States. So to emphasize, we're not simply talking about problems of fraud, at the ballot box or inaccuracies in the count, electoral integrity involves all of these stages, all of which need to be made. We have evidence, and we have three sources of evidence to try to compare elections over time and over countries. We can look at the formal rules, for example, the Comparative Constitutions Project. We can look at expert perceptions of how these work in practice, and things like the perception of, e perception of electoral integrity index, and Varieties of Democracy Project give evidence on that. And then, of course, citizens' attitudes and behaviour. Do they have trust and confidence in the process? And that's, for example, from the World Value Survey. So this is what it looks like if we take the issue of how far there are differences in electoral integrity using the summary index from the perception of electoral integrity index. And it's colour coded. We can see immediately there are problems in Africa. There are problems in Central Asia and in parts of Southeast Asia. But we can also see most dramatically that the United States comes out as high, but not very high. So despite having uh, 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 democratic processes and a long established democracy, it's still not where other countries, whether it's Canada, Scandinavia, or, or, or Western Europe, in terms of the way in which elections are run. It's much more like the rest of Latin America uh, which has a number of problems. And again, this emphasizes this. If we look in the overall index, it's a 100 point index and it ranks all countries, 166 worldwide. 
And if we look at the first column, which is just the liberal democracies defined by VDEM, we'd immediately see the United States is second to last. It scores 57 out of 166 countries in the overall quality of all the elections from 2012 to 2019. And as we can also see, many other countries are ranked much more highly, not simply affluent Scandinavian countries, but also countries like Costa Rica, Estonia, Uruguay, uh, Taiwan, Latvia, many new democracies. And it's not simply there are long-standing problems, these problems have got worse. So we asked experts what are the major issues and what emerged was essentially issues of contention. We said what's better or worse from 2016 to 2020 and immediately you can see this issues like acceptance of the integrity of the elections, public trust, legal disputes, political protests, all of those are much more problematic according to the experts in 2020 than in 2016. Now why are there growing threats? What's the heart of the problem here? And again most of the media has focused on President Trump and his followers and his supporters of reasons and again the literature says there are many factors which lead to the country being polarized or problems in Congress, problems in the elections or problems of authoritarian populism in a cultural backlash. I'm going to emphasize just four today. Party polarization, partisan control of state laws, authoritarian populist values, and institutional inertia. Let me give you quickly some evidence. Firstly, party We know how, how much that's always being debated in terms of stalemate within the Senate, but what is less emphasized is that this is not a brand new problem by any means, it's a long-term issue. And you can look at these trends, which are roll call votes from DW Nominate since the foundation of the Republic. And you can look at the figures in particular from 1980. The Democrats in their votes in Congress have slightly shifted in a more liberal direction, a progressive uh, group. But nevertheless, if you look at the Republicans, the red line, you can immediately see that ever since Reagan, the party in Congress has been moving towards the right to in a more socially conservative view, both on taxes and spending, but also on social issues of gun control and abortion, religion and politics, and a wide range of other issues like uh, uh, respect for uh, LGBTQ rights and so on. So the gap has been growing in Congress. And if we look at this, What's now clear, and this is from the survey of experts of the party positions in December 2019, is that the two parties are diametrically opposed. The US Democrats are within the centre of a range of other Labour, Social Democratic and left-wing parties on issues like their social values and their economic values. By contrast, the US Republican Party is far to the right and it's close to authoritarian populists like the Swiss People's Party, like Vox in Spain, or Likud in Israel. And so we have a party system which is uh, almost uniquely rare in being a two-party system with no other parties uh, represented other than a single uh, independent, but with uh, a wide range of different values, divided not just on their policies, but also on democracy. This again is from the Global Party Survey, and it shows how far they favour all balance, uh, checks and balances on the executive, and how far they favour democratic principles. And again, you can see that the US Democrats are centre left. They're with many other parties which are in power and in government in Western Europe. But we can also see the US um, Republicans, the GOP, is far to the right. And they're close to Polish law and justice, or they're close to Hungarian Fidesz or the French National Front, Rally of uh, the Republic. And this is a trend again, which is not new. This is from VDEM, and this is the rise of Republican illiberalism, according to their experts, starting in the mid 90s under Clinton, continuing under Bush, continuing under Obama, and then sharply rising under Trump. And again, this is a similar trend showing support for free and fair elections, commitment to it in the leadership. And again, 
the Republicans in the red line go down, they plummet in 2000, they recover somewhat and then they go down again. So parties are polarised about the rules and then parties control state electoral laws. There is a lack of a central federal body with an effective role like an electoral management body to set standards and the existing bodies are very weak and have weakened over time. And today there are over 300 bills, according to the Brennan Centre, in 43 states that propose to restrict voting rights. And the example of Georgia, which has been passed along with five other states passing similar legislation, shows the number of steps they're taking in order to restrict voting rights and even worse, increase the pressures on independent electoral officials so that the weaknesses that were revealed in 2020 may be exacerbated in 2022. And of course, it's not simply in the state houses or in Congress. It's also problems in the electorate. A loss of confidence in American elections, a long term slide in support for democracy and rising support for authoritarianism, exemplified by the insurrection, but with roots which are much deeper than this. So here is some evidence on public perceptions in America, on electoral integrity and malpractices. There's high levels of confidence in countries like Sweden, Norway and Denmark amongst the general public, just as we've seen amongst the experts. But amongst all the democracies, the United States is uniquely low. And indeed, it's much closer to other countries which have had some problems, whether it's Peru or Tunisia. And public opinion, clearly, after the election, has divided over the integrity. If we asked, for example, immediately after the election in a YouGov poll of the electorate, how much fraud do you think has occurred? Eight out of 10 Trump supporters said enough to influence the outcome. Now, maybe you think that's just a sore loser attitude and maybe it'll fade over time. There's another similar YouGov poll in March, well after the insurrection. And, it, and the question asks, do you agree Biden did not legitimately win the election? And still eight out of 10 Trump voters and Republicans agreed with that view which is a legitimacy crisis. And there's been declining support for democracy, according to the World Value Survey, over many years. In 1995, it was ubiquitous, having approval of having a democracy, and it went down, particularly by 2011, before a slight recovery, but nowhere near the level it was before. And similarly, support for strongman leaders in America as a good system of government without having to bother with elections has risen steadily in every successive world value survey from a quarter of the electorate to 38% of the electorate. Fourthly, why can't any of these challenges be addressed? And the reason I'd argue is institutional inertia. That the Republican Party has no incentive to reform. In particular, often parties change move back in towards the median voter to get the popular vote when they've had successive defeats, not just one bad defeat, but a couple. And indeed, the Republican track record on the White House has been poor, but they're very likely to gain House seats in the next election and regain control of the Senate, given the historical records. The party itself in Congress has become more Trumpist and less moderate because people have left and Liz Cheney as a leader, for example, has been weakened. And Republicans are still very successful in state legislatures. So why change course? And they win in particular, despite not having a majority of the popular vote through the rules of the game. Party primaries, which means they can appeal to the MAGA base, not necessarily to the median voter gerrymandered safe districts, which incumbents get returned, and donors that like to support strong incumbents. And the rules, in particular, the disproportionality of the House, of the Senate and the Electoral College, due to the overrepresentation of rural America, allows Republicans to win office without a majority of the popular vote. Geography has always mattered as much as uh, the share of the vote. 
So individual Republicans back Trump partly because they have no incentive to do otherwise. And even those who were critical initially of the insurrection, like Kevin McCarthy, have now come back and are clearly following Trump's lead. What is to be done? Well, quite simply, there's a comp comprehensive set of reforms and the Democrats have created HR1 for the People Act, a systematic way to improve elections, to make sure that gerrymandering is weakened, voting rights are respected, national voter registration standards are maintained, there's more transparency in campaign funding, there's greater electoral security and there's greater government ethics. But the bill passed the House but was filibustered and failed in the Senate. So the Democrats are going to need to either reform by weakening or abolish outright the Senate, Senate rule on the filibuster. They can do that, but some of their own members are reluctant to do so. And even if they get this passed, even if HR1 becomes law, they still face major challenges in the courts and the recent decisions in Arizona by the Supreme Court last week suggest they do not favour um, uh, using the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to prevent restrictive practices. And even if the law gets passed also, there are many other reforms that need to be um, brought in in America. So the public opinion supports these reforms in the majority, but it's very unlikely at present that there's a political path forward. American democracy is stuck like the boat in the Nile and HR1 could potentially change dramatically the electoral system in a way that hasn't been seen for decades now. But how it can be done is a problem which uh, is going to have to be resolved between now and 2022 midterm elections running out. The conclusions. Briefly, what are the implications? Well, firstly, many of the issues I've talked about have been studied by Americanists, whether it's gerrymandering or voting reform or campaign communications, but there have been very weak links between all of that research and literature and the broader work, which is often on developing countries and new democracies. That needs to be strengthened. We need to bring both communities together so that they are speaking not at cross purposes, but they can learn from each other. Secondly, we need to bring in both the public and surveys of the mass electorate, as well as surveys of the objective evidence. It's only if we bring the two things together that we can understand why, for example, so many people believe the big lie and the role of conspiracy theories in public trust and confidence in elections. Thirdly, we need to focus on time series. Any decline and backsliding process is one which is not a single step, it's a series of steps. So we need to really have a dynamic process which we monitor over time. And the newer data is now giving us that time series, allowing us to look at the process. And lastly, we can't just look at elections in isolation. We need to understand authoritarian populism as well as a broader set of developments in society, which is affecting many countries around the world. So thank you very much. I hope that this thinks about a new agenda and where we're going from the American perspective and I look forward to seeing the next generation of research and the new leadership for the EIP project and where it goes in the, in the future. Thank you very much.